Well, as I was getting out of the car for the second time, I was thinking I gotta open with an apology. And a little voice in my head said, no you don't. And so I'm not gonna apologize. I'm gonna tell you you're gonna have a unique, probably unique, but certainly rare opportunity to hear me speak extemporaneously. Very good. Because after working on my notes for about five hours today, being uninspired on Monday and having a little time, I uh, managed to lose them on my computer at home. And I was doing everything from the zip drive. Normally I'll back it up both ways, but I said, no, I've got it on the zip drive, that's fine. So when I opened it here, what I saw was what I left with on Monday. So we managed to throw away all my notes. And in seminary, one of the more useful things I learned was something I was told early on, is that when you were doing a sermon or a teaching, you prepare as if there is no Holy Spirit, and then you rely on the Holy Spirit as if there was no preparation. And practically speaking, tonight there was no preparation. Seems like it was just a couple weeks ago when I was talking about Zephaniah 2, and I had a lot of trouble with Zephaniah and Zechariah. I tried to, in fact, at one point I had the title on this of Zephaniah instead of Zechariah. I said, wait a minute, that can't be right. But uh, last time I taught, I was following my beloved brother Steve, who was forced to speak extemporaneously on my behalf because I wasn't here. So I think this might be my loving, joking payback from God here. Oh. Oh. <laughs> but uh, I also wanted to hear what Steve had to say last week. Apparently that doesn't show up for a week or three for the men. Everybody else is obedient. <laughs> Our teachings aren't immediately available. Let's start with the reading of Zechariah 7, which I do have printed out because that's how far I got it. But even that took seven minutes for friends. <laughs> In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of Adonai came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month in Kislev. Now Bethel sent Sarazar and Regum Melech together with his men to seek the favor of Adonai and to speak to the Kohanim of the house of Adonai, Sahot, and to the prophet saying, should I mourn and consecrate myself in the fifth month, as I have done for so many years? Then the word of Adonai followed, came to me, saying, Speak to all the people of the land, and the Kohanim, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh months in the past seventy years, did you really fast for me? When you eat and drink, are you not eating and drinking for yourself? Are not these the words that Adonai proclaimed through the former prophets from Jerusalem when the surrounding cities were inhabited and prosperous, when the Negev and the lowland were inhabited? Again the word of Adonai came to Zechariah saying, Thus says Adonai and Zephaniah, Administer true judgment and practice mercy and compassion each to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the outsider or the poor. Furthermore, do not let any of you devise evil against one another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention. They stubbornly turned their backs and stopped their ears from hearing. Indeed, they made their hearts as hard as flint, preventing them from hearing the Torah were the words that Adonai the Spotlight sent by his Ruach through the former prophets. Consequently, great wrath came from Adonai the Spotlight. It came about that just as he called and they did not listen. So they would call and I would not listen, says Adonai the Spotlight. I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations they have, they have not known. Thus the land was left so desolate behind them that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. All right. In verses, and, uh, 
did scribble a few words I remember just so I wouldn't forget them when I got up here under pressure. <laughs> we started with one through three. In the fourth year of King Darius, the word of God and I came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month of Kislev. Okay. Uh, that was one of the notes I had, and I believe that was the year 520, or excuse me, 553 BC. And that is December, and Kislev is a month on the Jewish calendar. Now Bethel sent Serzar and the Reg of Melek together with this man to seek the favor of Adonai. Bethel here is, I learned this in my study, when you say, and I think it's really Bethel, but since we all say Bethel because we're English, we'll stick with that. But I think just about everybody here has heard that means house of God. What I learned that was new there is that it is always referring to a location other than the temple or a worship place. This is a town or city of Bethel. Uh, when you are speaking of God's house, it is normally Beit Elohim or Beit Ha Elohim. It's using the full formal name as opposed to the Greek. What looks like an abbreviation, I don't know that for a fact. But El refers, refers to God as really kind of a short version of Elohim. And the folks that were sent from this town, and I did do remember one thing, that with this town, they weren't necessarily occupying Jerusalem because there still wasn't a wall, uh, a wall around it, so they were likely staying in a safer location. But they sent Sarah's there, and there was Sarah's there, and that was, there was some confusion over what that name meant. So I, I don't remember all the confusing details I've got it down, so we'll skip that. And the Reagan Melech together with his men. So they were sent the town as a whole, and I assume that was the elders of the town, were sending these men to go speak to the which is the priests. And that name is kind of interesting. Melech, you might know, is king. And the other word comes from the gathering of stones to stone someone that was worthy of punishment. But it also sort of means consolidating or gathering together. So it's gathering strength in the, in the original case of that. It's gathering strength to put someone to death. And that's attached to God. So it's a consolidating for God, but it might be consolidating for a purpose that may not be very exciting for those that are around at that time. So it's an interesting name, and it means to mean something. We don't necessarily actually know what those two together meant. One of the things that, that Sarazar does imply is that this was someone that was born during the captivity. It's not someone that's returning to the land. And they are going to go to the priest, and the and it does say house of Adonai Tzal. Tzal, which is one of those words I really struggle saying. And it does sort of sound like Sabal, which is Sabbath, but it's not. That's when you have an oath, it's or a battle in the end, it is plural. But that is a word that basically means hosts, and it's plural hosts otherwise. And that's a mili more military term, and it's he's the god of the armies, the fighting forces. God. And that is the word that's used in almost every reference to God throughout this passage. So something to keep in mind. And the question is, should I, and I presume the I there is the gee, I never thought of that, but the, the king of Babel, which that sounds wrong. But whoever 
is leading the folks there from a standpoint of being in charge is going to ask the prophets, the priests, if he should continue to consecrate himself on the fifth month as he's done for so many years. And in so many years, we pretty much know it's 70 years because that was the term of captivity. And the question sounds like a very reasonable one, and why do you do want to go to God? Because the circumstances have changed. But we'll see shortly that the motivation behind it may be a little messed up. And if you read between the lines, you can almost think that he might be bragging that he's been celebrating this time of mourning and fasting for so many years. Verse 4. And I'll take this pause for our judge's entry to turn this puppy off. I'll have to tell him later. That's a, one of our members <coughs> asking if I'll be at church tomorrow. I'm at church now. Where are you? But, uh, <coughs> verse 4. Then the word of Adonai and Sopho came to me saying, Speak to all the people of the land and to the Kohanim, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh months for the past 70 years, did you really fast for me? And as is often the case when we take our questions to God, at least for me, I, most of the times I know I've clearly heard God's voice has been in a question. And you'll see that throughout the Bible. We'll often, especially Jesus, often respond to a question with a question. And that's kind of what's happening here. Um, it's also, I guess, for God, they all are. This is a question that you can't answer. And the word for that, and I forgot the word in my moment here. But uh, I, in fact, I love the word. But <laughs> anyway, it's a question that you're not supposed to respond to because the answer is supposed to be obvious. And with that definition, at least somebody will remember the word I can. Rhetorical well, question. That is the word. Rhetorical question. Thank you. The, but this question is one, like I said, it is addressing people's hearts. You know, why are you, why were you doing this? Was it really for me? And the answer there is no. And one of the things that's in this that really isn't clear in the text is this is mourning and fasting. There's a word in there in the Hebrew that, and it's actually an extreme form of mourning. So they haven't been, I mean, this is somebody died or there's a catastrophe. And there really was a catastrophe. They've been sent into exile. So that is the source of the mourning. And when he asks that question, he's basically having them search their hearts to see why were we doing this? And it really, and the implication is that they're doing it because they're miserable. They miss their home. It's about them. It's not about God. It's not remembering why they got sent there in the first place. It's just being sad for their situation. And that's something I think we can all identify with. And on the verse 6, when you eat and drink, are you not eating and drinking for yourself? Now they are celebrating because they're back in the land. But again, are they thanking God for it? Or are they just having a party because they're free at last? And that seems to be the implication as well. And then we get into the Here's why he's asking the questions. Are not these the words that Adonai proclaimed through the former prophets in Jerusalem with its surrounding cities were inhabited and prosperous when the Negev and the Lowland were inhabited? He basically is saying when you had it before, you didn't appreciate it. And now that you've got it back, you're still not appreciating what I've given you. And now for 
where I was planning on focusing, and it'll be even more so because this is what hit me the hardest is in the next few verses. And in 8, it says, Again, the word about Abide came to Zechariah saying, and that's basically saying that Zechariah is hearing the same thing the previous prophets did, hearing from God, and he's sharing that. Thus said Adonai Talot, administer true judgment and practice mercy and compassion each to his brother. To me, verse 9 is the focus not only of this chapter, but it is a central theme of the book and of the entire Bible. It is one of my favorite verses. In fact, it used to be my life verse for many years. It was, it was the uh, Micah 6 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good to practice justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And that might be paraphrased a little, or I might have landed on some translation, and that's the meaning of it. And, and that is almost exactly what's being said here. The administer true judgment, which I kind of like that, is in the version I was looking at. And judgment to us is a negative. Most of us think of judgment as a not very pleasant word. And the word here is mishpah. And that word has a lot of meanings, but judgment, law, are part of that. But it also has, and most Hebrew words are so loaded with meaning that you can write an entire book on one, which I've got right here. <laughs> but we'll get to that shortly. But it also has the underlying tone of, it, of the justice that is merciful, it's kind, it is for the best outcome for all. Um, justice in our society is man's justice. And this is talking about God's justice. And the English word there that I really am drawn to, and that is true judgment and administer. It's basically practice seeking the truth of a situation, not just judging it on the outside appearance. So we're looking at judging as close as possible of the way God judges things. Look to the inner meanings of things, not just the superficial that we normally look at before we judge anything. And I think part of the reason it's such a negative word in English is we are looking at man's judgment. And that is often evil, even when it is lawful. Right. Then we have practice mercy and compassion. And that is, and practice is an important word there in the English. Because practicing implies that you're never going to perfect it. You have to keep working at it. But those are two words that are very common and very commonly found together. Uh, the mercy is raka or rakaim, which is basically the plural. And that is a compassion that is most closely connected with taking care of the helpless, uh, taking care of the poor, taking care of children. It actually comes from a from the mother's womb is the base word for that. So it is a love that is comes out of just the, the being of being a mom and loving your children when they're born. And that is a part of the love God has for us. And that is illustrated when we go on to ten as not oppress the widow or orphan. Those would be folks that are less capable. The outsider, the stranger in the land. 
or the poor. All those showing mercy and caring for those people all show that you are practicing the uh, Maha. And that is one of the important verbs that God tells us to do every time we turn around. And the other one is, well, it's the most important one in my opinion, but Chesed is also one of the hardest ones to say correctly. Most of the time you hear it Chesed, which is fine because the CH and the H are very close in the Hebrew alphabet. But the Chesed is one that this book is written about. And this was the guy I was with last week, so you're going to get some of his wisdom for me today. But Michael Carter wrote this, it's inexpressible, and then the subtitle is Chesed, the Mystery of God's Loving Kindness. And loving kindness is a word that was actually made up in the King James Bible to it was a new English word to try to wrap their thoughts around this hesed, which is God's love. Uh, Mike does a definition that I love, but the first thing he says is this is just you know, the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to this word than that. And his definition is hesed is when Someone who owes you nothing gives you everything. And I think I've said that before in here because I've been enjoying that ever since I first heard him say it several years ago. But the, I don't know if you can see it. And actually, I probably, I've written my notes. You won't have time to do this, but maybe I do. This entire, I can read it because of the fine print. This page, if you can see all the words there, are the different words that Hesed is translated into in the English versions of the Bible. And I'll see what I can see, and I'll probably skip most of them. Love, that's the first one here. The loving kindness, merciful love, loyal, sure, relents, relentless, enduring, extravagant, affectionate love, all those. It's sometimes just satisfaction. And it's love in action. It's dependable, steady, true. It's fundamental. It's miraculous. Generous, deep, wonderful, great, incredible, marvelous, gracious. I can't make this. Loyal, steadfast. Election. It's a choice. Unfailing, faithful. Loving instruction. Uh, covenant love. And that's one that's been around a long time. And that's been sort of the definition in the past. But the problem with the covenant love is that makes it sound like well, God has to do it because he has a covenant with us to love us. But that's backwards. Because he loved us so much, he made the covenant. So uh, he's going to keep it, but he made it willingly because of his essence. Uh, I'm halfway down the page. Let's see if I can slide through here. Kindness. Uh, divine kindness. A lot of these are the same adjectives in front of kindness and in front of mercy. Mercy is a big part of that. Benevolence, compassion. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is another one that's multiple times with different adjectives. And this one, I'm not even sure, I'd have to think about it, but reliable solidarity. <laughs> so that's Hesed. And I wonder if that's, you know, God is perfectly fine alone, but he didn't want to be, so he's reliable. That's my best shot at what they were trying to get at there. Ardent zeal. That's kind of nice. You can also be pity. Clemency. And then there's a couple where it's rock or bedrock. 
something solid to build upon. Friendship, loyal friendship. And it goes on and on. And there are actually some that are not so, I mean, all of these have been good traits, but sometimes it's a negative. Uh, it's got disgrace, reproach, shameful, wicked, and those are rare. But those, most Hebrew words you can have multiple meanings of. One of PD's favorite, and you'll hear multiple definitions of it each time he closes, is Shalom. And it has a lot of meanings. Uh, one I've never heard him say from stage, I don't even know if he's aware of it, but one that I got from my Hebrew professor in college was that it can mean death to your enemies. That's not a very positive statement, but that can be a source of shalom. So hesed is such a rich word, like I said, this was written by that. And I've heard it somewhere, but I like it and I want it to be true and it does sort of take God who we will never understand and put him in a very small box and that's a bad thing. But it has been said that Hesed is the defining characteristic of God. And that doesn't mean that's the only thing that describes him. But most of the rest of the character of God comes out of his divine love. So that's a word that I wanted to I wish it, we just move it into the English language. Maybe stick with Hesed, which is easier to say that Hesed. The uh, meaning needs to be in our language, and it's not. Okay, we've got the, these are examples of practicing mercy and compassion. We already read it. You know, we don't oppress the poor, widow, or orphan. Furthermore, do not let any of you devise evil against one another in your heart. And Jesus later taught that you know, if you think evil towards someone, that's the same as murder. But that's not a new principle God suddenly came up with when Jesus was here. That's always been the case. All of our evil deeds begin with evil thoughts. If we can fight off those evil thoughts in a much better position to approach God and have his approval. And then we get to verse 11, which is the reality and the world of all of God's children. But they refuse to pay attention. They stubbornly turn their backs and stop their ears from hearing. Indeed, they make their hearts as hard as flint preventing them from hearing the Torah or the words that Adonai and Sabo sent by his Ruach through the former prophets. How often, I know, I, well, I'll just go to me. I will frequently refuse to pay attention. And it's not always such a deliberate act as it sounds here. Often it's a, I don't want to hear that right now. I may want to hear it later. I do that with God, I do that with people. And part of tonight's adventure for me has been, you know, you're, you're preparing on your strength. I want, to, I want to rely on mine. And I did get that with not quite that clear a tone, but that's what I can see through this. And part of that is for me growing. I am terrified of experiencing, I can't say that, of speaking without notes. <laughs> Extemporaneous. <laughs> I've always blown about Michael. Uh, and I was with him all last week, so I'm bringing him up a lot. But just a superb Bible teacher. But he loves to throw these big words at you. There's a word I can't remember. Maybe you know it. It's a word that was created to point to Something in the Bible that you only see once. A box that's going on. There you go. 
Uh, I have an awful feeling you might have. <laughs> it's a Greek expression, actually. Well. And I, I do agree. You only see it in Greek grammar. For basis, me. but it's a common for the scholars. And that just goes to show, I think, I think you might be one of the greatest hidden treasures of this church. Mm -hmm. in the here, right? so, but he, he, one of the things he says right before he'll throw one of those at us is, you know, why use a small word that everybody knows when you can use a big word that nobody knows? And, uh, and he's got a ton of them, but you will get that sometimes from the moment. I don't think that's what he's kind of poking fun at, but he's also trying to teach us. And I've already forgotten what the word is, and don't say it again, because then I'll try to remember it again. But we don't pay attention. And sometimes it's volitional, sometimes it's accidental. But they, the Hebrew children, have been doing that for their entire existence. And Adam started it. And it's part of our fallen nature. Suddenly turned their backs and stopped their ears from hearing. And one of the things I thought about when I read that was relationships with other people. When, and this is a selfish act, but when I get to the point of I'm fed up with this person's complaining, or bring it home. I'm tired of my wife nagging me about that. I actually am passive aggressive to the point where the more you tell me to do something, the less likely I am to do it. And I have to actively fight that impulse. And that's kind of, I think, part of what's going on here. They've been hearing it since God sent Abram on his journey. You know, listen to me, follow my commandments. And it's very hard to do. They made their hearts as hard as flint, preventing them from hearing the Torah or the words that Adonai Tzahalot sent by his Ruach, which is spirit, to the former prophets. He says, you know, I've been saying it all along through the prophets directly, but when your heart's hard, you're not going to listen. And that goes with God. Is burning towards God. If something happened, like losing your notes, and you don't think that should have happened, it's all God's fault. I mean, we do it all the time, even though I don't think anybody's going to want to admit that. And no, I didn't really feel like it was there because there were so many things that had to happen. I said, well, this has got to be God. So, but Lord, really, God, you know what it is. But it is fun how often He'll take us out of our comfort zone. Which 70 years in Babylon was a pretty major discomfort zone for his people, but he'll take us there to teach us something and to help us in our journey. And we don't have bad things happen to us as punishment nearly as often as we think. Sometimes there are consequences, but God is not a punisher. He will allow the circumstances to lead us back to him. He's always a loving father. Again, Chesed is his primary feature, his love. And any of you have children or spouse that you feel like you are willing to lay down your life for, you may or may not be. But God not only is, he did. And if we can get even a minor grasp of that kind of love, we'll know that we're not, you know, God is not the little kid with the big old magnifying lens, you know, burning the things off of the critters that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. It's just not even close to God. But many, many non-believers that want that, so they want nothing to do with the God of love who created them. So we need to reflect that love. And that's, like I said, the central issue of this and the entire Bible. And then there are consequences. And there's 
to work. Consequently, great wrath came from Adonai Solomon. It came about that just as he called and they did not listen, so they would call and I would not listen, says Adonai Solomon. That says, okay, you won't listen to me, then when you need me, I won't listen to you. And that really isn't so much a not hearing you, but he's not going to respond until we come to him in humility. I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations. They have not known. They were sent far from home. Thus the land was left so desolate behind them that no one passed through or returned. For they made the pleasant land desolate. And that land was something that before all this happened, it was a beautiful land and full of life. And that desolation has been offset considerably by the restoration of Israel. But for the last 2,200 years, it's been a pretty desolate region. And there's still parts of it that uh, one of the things that we saw some pictures of where it was the Negev, the desert. And it is, I mean, you're in Jerusalem, you can go over a hill and then it's like you're on the surface of the moon. It's just that desolate. And it's, and if you haven't been to this far, I mean, and you have the opportunity, I'd encourage you to think it. Even if it means you don't get to go to the beach for a couple of trips. But, but it is an amazing adventure there. And so many of the things that you read and just sort of gloss over make so much more sense. One of those is stoning is a punishment. There aren't too many places you can go in Israel where you can't pick up a lot of pretty deadly rocks. So that was something that could happen just about anywhere. So it's that's a lousy example, but there's so many things that are meaningful here. Uh, the difference in, between going just 10 miles as far as the landscape, the weather, you know, when you get down around the Dead Sea, you're in one of the lowest places on the planet. And, uh, I know it's the lowest place <laughs> there are places you can go that are deeper than the bottom of the Dead Sea. But as far as dry land, that's one of the lowest places on Earth. And it's amazing what little differences that can make. It is almost impossible to get sunburned when you're several hundred feet below sea level. The sun's out there and it's bright and it's warm. But with that extra layer of atmosphere, you're very slow to sunburn there. And you can go, well, Mount Carmel is, is an amazing elevation. And I mean, you can see all of the length of Israel from a few points in Israel, pretty close to all of it. And you realize how small an area it is, but you've got great agriculture around the Sea of Galilee, which is probably the least accurate name we've got for it, but that's how most people refer to it. There are just so many different things there in such a small area, and there's so much history that you can live there a lifetime and not take it all in. All righty. Rattled on longer than I thought I had. Well, I'm looking at the questions from two months ago. So <laughs> I didn't have some written out, but they were basically, and I wouldn't even need to break into a small group, seven is a wonderful number. But one of the things I wanted to discuss were, was that central passage and what God's mishpat, his judgment means to you and how you were to exercise that. 
and the same with the mercy, the rachaim, and chesed. How do we see that in God, and how do we reflect that in our own lives? How do we practice it as it puts it so well here? And we'll start with judgment. Where do you feel like you're, you land on the continuum from being a harsh judge to being a good judge, to hearing all of the story before you pass judgment? Because we all do. And I can say, judge not or you be judged. Well, it does not say, don't be discerning. And we are all going to be judged, but we've also all been forgiven of things. So when that one's turned on you, turn it back, because everybody judges. And that can be done in a righteous way, or it can be done in a way that damages relationships. What are your thoughts? Or experiences? What translation are you reading from? The Tree of Life. Actually, I usually can't remember that. It's uh, TLD is the abbreviation on the Ghost Bible. And it was done from a uh, Jewish believer's perspective. In fact, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but a wonderful guy has been here and spoken several times. Jeffrey Seth. I think was one of the many Jewish scholars that put that together. And it's my new favorite for no other reason. It reminds me of some words I've forgotten. It's, not <laughs> it's on the, you got the Bible out? The TLB. TLB. Yeah, TLB. You version of the Bible And we also have a very nice leather bound room in the cafe that I bought for my wife when they first came in three years ago, I think. Christmas time. So they're, they are available, and like I said, it's, there are a few things I've run into that oh, I don't like that as much, but for the most part, it's a translation I greatly right? appreciate. Speaking of judging, I'm judging Bible versions there. Um, regarding judgment, for myself, I tend to listen too quick. No, speak too quickly and listen too slowly. <laughs> and I am pretty sure you're not alone in that. But if you're able to put yourself in someone else's position, how often does that happen to you and anger you or hurt you that you're being judged incorrectly by someone else? Think of those things when we're doing it to others. Yeah, that sounds like a golden rule. <laughs> it's, it's a folly for folly to answer for the year, right? Like the Proverbs. There's always something that there's always something that I just can try to make it my bottom line. You know, obviously I struggle with everybody else does, but it's there's something always missing in terms of my perception. <laughs> when dealing with an issue or even a person asking for advice to try to ask good questions. You know, sometimes they don't even know what they're asking. You know, they don't realize it, you don't realize it because you have a few good, solid questions. But we assume we understand what everybody is saying. And then and when they're this question mark on their face. Well, you're not listening to me. Well, maybe it's because you're not answering the question they're asking. And we, one of the things that has really been driven to me in the last couple of years is how often we make assumptions about what's being said without really listening to it. Or we hear what we want to hear is another way to put that. This is what we expect to hear, so that's what we hear even when that's not said. And uh, a bunch of those have come back lately to bite me in the backside. 
but it is something to be aware of. And the other way around too. You can tell somebody something as clearly as you can possibly tell it, and that isn't what they hear. So we need to constantly be testing that, and not respond in anger because our judgment is premature. It was like a drive-through. I can't remember what I heard it. The drive-through method was what I've heard it called. Where basically, you, you say something and then you have the person repeat it back to you. <laughs> Make sure I've done that in counseling. You've probably done that too in counseling, and it's like, wow, well, that was that <laughs> Because I'll repeat something back. Right? You repeat back what you didn't hear. It's like something way different. You ask. Okay, what did I just tell you? Yeah. Now tell me what you just heard. <laughs> it can be entertaining if nothing else. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, active listening is part of that. And that's basically, if you tell me something, I respond telling you what I just heard. And it's amazing how often you say, no, that's not what I said. Oh, oh let's try again. You've got to be careful with that because you get to annoy people. <laughs> They're that easily annoyed that there are other issues there. All right. How do you feel about being a mama's womb? The mercy, the compassion for those, <clears throat> for those that you, well, can be those you control. And I think one of my I think, that if I remember correctly, the joke I wrote in my notes is, you know, I have, I have, <coughs> excuse me, a water, apparently. <coughs> I have rock out of theme for my stupid cats. I mean, they do things that hurt me all the time or that are really stupid, but, you know, they don't know any better. I have to realize that. I work for a lot of people, too. And it doesn't mean they're stupid. It means, again, they don't have the same expectation you do. You've got couples that will fight wildly over being messy or being clean. And you've got the OCD married to the slob. Mm -hmm. And neither of them are right or wrong. It's just the expectation is you're supposed to be like me. That's never the case. So that's one to watch out for. And if we have that level of compassion of trying to be understanding, it goes a long way in mitigating any damage those sort of things cause. All of our, almost all of our arguments and difficult times come out of our selfishness, out of our pride of sins in yourself. And if you can look at that when you're at odds with somebody and analyze the situation without the emotion taking over, then it, that can go a long way towards showing love in situations. Another wonderful definition, and this was from the Greek economy, but it's the same sort of thing, is that Agape is loving the unlovable. You are giving them something they don't deserve. It's back to sort of the same definition. But, I, in fact, another one of my favorite teachers basically says, if you love somebody who loves you, that's not love, that's reward. You're just reciprocating what you're receiving. To truly love, it has to be someone that really is not lovable. And then my favorite, Chesed. The inexpressible love of God. Short version of this book. We are supposed to practice that. And that's the toughest call of all of us. How many of us give to others with no thought of return? 
no expectation of even a thank you. It's hard to do. But that is the beginning of Hesse. Well, then Mike said, actually, this is a book that I'm also pretty talking about, it, is that he tries to go about doing small acts of Hesse every day. One of those is he sees, you know, um, I guess it would be sexist in here because they're all guys, but he'll see little old ladies with their buggy carts trying to do what's right and taking it back to the bin or back to the store, and he'll run up and get it and take it back for them. You know, real easy, real minor thing to do. He says so far in doing that, he's had two women that broke down crying. Thank no you. way. And, uh, <laughs> You never know how much a, a minor act of love or just thoughtful random kindness. Random act of kindness. kindness. <laughs> Don't make it random, make it on purpose and, and do it. I mean, I love the, the thought with the expression I always struggle with the word. But random's not bad either. If we can, every time we encounter somebody, look at a way I can show them love big a difference that would make in our relationships and in our life and in their lives. There's a lady this today she was telling me she's a believer and uh work with she had uh, her daughter brought in the lady to work this morning, pouring down the rain, flat <coughs> car. The guy comes, stops to help, says I'll help you but you need to pay me. And they were a little bit skeptical and uh, and then just a little bit later, finally, the, it's, it's, it's a work project thing. And the boss lady, you know, sent them out. Went out there to help them. They were trying to figure out the. And this is you know, two or three one in there. Trying to figure out the tire thing. The other guy shows up while they're doing it. He fixes it for them, and he comes back to them and he gives them two hundred dollar Christmas one hundred dollar bill and says you're going to need to get two new tires. Good for fix that and they walk off. Yeah. Like and if you said her daughter and was her crime and stuff. Says it's really trying to figure out the counterfeit one. Not for that. I think that is a tremendous part of wit. I do not take that lightly at all because I think that is something we should do every day as part of the week. And it's not hard to do. I mean, we find people that need something every single day, whether it's the buggy back or the tire change or the or, or just going in Lowe's and, and, the, and, the, the, and the workers are standing up there watching you and won't come and help you load and you have a guy load 10 sheets of plywood and he, and he is just... And you can tell, and it's the it's the number one emotion sometimes, because they don't people don't help each other like they should. You know? mm -hmm. But that's a witness to me. Mm -hmm. I and I do feel like I'm preaching in the choir out here. <laughs> I've seen many of you. So well, there's a lot more of good testimonies than I do. There's a lot of good testimony. There's you know, they probably like I mean, I think two or three things, but this I believe it's it's healthy to with one another to bear those testimonies to one another because I mean sometimes we, we, if we train ourselves as a disciple perhaps we do have a mindset like we mentioned with a friend maybe it's not that but it's in some way shape or form to be prepared to lift the burden off somebody to serve or something like that but you know the weight of how that carries in this world uh, it does have a strong impact I mean you know you invite somebody after serving them like that to church or uh, to discipleship or some of us here at Gospel Track to do something like that after serving, I mean, it's much more, more well received. You know, it's like you plow the soil a little bit and then you saw the truth and with it. That's a way to live with it. I think there's an expression for that. It's called witnessing by example. Mm -hmm. there, there's no saying that says, you are the only Bible that some people will, will ever read. Mm -hmm. Say, so what is the gospel according to you? <laughs> and, to do, and to do that correctly, 
is much harder than witnessing by going through the Romans Road or the, any other plant leading them to salvation. That's still important. But the hardest one is doing it by example. And then how do we react when we all, all of our love is rejected? And God's sort of brought to mind uh, two examples. One's too close to others, so I won't use it. But when day after day, month after month, year after year, you were pouring out to somebody that, you know, maybe sometimes appreciates it, but frequently doesn't, and can ultimately reject you. I had a good friend I loaned thousands of dollars to, and I never really expected it back, and I was okay with that. And he had been a Christian when he was younger, but uh, so many things <coughs> happened to him over the years that he got better. And I was constantly trying to encourage him. And the lad, uh, he may not even still be alive, but he had, you know, stage four cancer that sort of came out of the room. And I tried again, you know, talking to him about God, saying he wasn't be and he was one of those that I would have thought of if you wanted an example of the you know, big, big mean little boy burning the legs off of the ants as, as he even got. <coughs> and all the boy told me, you know, never talk to me again. Well, I still love him. And I've tried a few times to see if he was okay without mentioning God, which was his problem. But you have no response. Can we do that and not be bitter about it? And still love somebody. <coughs> Honestly, with him, I often when we know each other well would say, you know, call him a saint. Just I, I would have killed his wife. I wouldn't live with her. She gave cause to leave. She was a, a, a woman that was very demanding and gave little attention or affection in return. And did him wrong in many ways. But he showed great love to her and I respected that. And that was part of my love for him. But so often we expect some, you know, some sort of thanks or reciprocal agreement. But when we get it, that's wonderful. That's a blessing. But when we don't, that should not affect how we treat the love others. And that's the love God wants to bring us closer and closer to. Like most things, we won't achieve them in this life. Practice them, we'll get better at it. And anybody else have anything they'd like to say before we close? I couldn't tell which way your head was shaking. No, no. <laughs> it was sort of from this angle. Not sure. Well, let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for this time together. And we want to judge with your righteous judgment and with it being not at all selfish, but totally from you. We want to show mercy and care for those that can't care for themselves. And most of all, we want to Love others, giving all we have, and expecting nothing in return. And Lord, that's what you've done to us, because we have nothing to give you except for our love, our obedience. And may we do those things because of the great love you've had for us. In the
fact that you've given us every good thing in our lives. And we don't always understand some of the things that we don't consider good. But if we trust you, we know that they will help us to grow. 